Welcome to the second of this year's uh, public lectures. Um, I missed the first because I, uh, I misplanned a holiday. So this is the first time that I've been involved in a live lecture, I think for about three and a half years. So it's really good to be back. Uh, I'm really hopeful as well that we'll have some catering uh, afterwards, uh, just outside. So that's something you don't get online. So anyway, my name is uh, Nick Gallant. Uh, some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, and I'm, uh, I'll be chairing uh, this evening. So the public lectures that we, that we run, we normally have five uh, each year. And uh, the purpose of them really is to uh, make the connections between researchers and practitioners who are working on topics that, uh, that we're working on or uh, relate to the work that we're working on. And our aim is to uh, instigate debate uh, around, those, around those topics. So the lecture that I missed uh, in October uh, was given by Professor, um, Professor Tuna Tassenkopf from the University of Amsterdam, who spoke on uh, spatial uh, governance landscapes. The rest of the year, uh, I'll introduce Francesco in a moment, but the rest of the year will see us uh, invite uh, Claire Collon, where's Claire, uh, to present her work on platform-based short rentals uh, in January. We'll then have uh, Professor Franklin Obeyna Doom from the University of Helsinki, who will be here in, uh, in March to talk about land rent and give his Georgist political economy perspective uh, on that. Uh, and then finally, we'll have the Sir Peter Hall lecture uh, in May that will be given by uh, Professor Margaret Crawford from uh, the University of Berkeley in California. Margaret should have been here, I think, two years ago, um, but because of the COVID uh, situation at the time, and the fact that she, she caught it, uh, she wasn't able to attend. So uh, we'll welcome Margaret uh, uh, late, later this year. If you want to find out about our lecture series, uh, you can search it, uh, Google it, BSP Public Lectures, and there's a back catalogue for the last, I think, I think 10 or 15 years uh, of uh, uh, YouTube videos, which uh, you can you can you know spend Christmas uh, catching up on, on the various issues we've covered during that period. So anyway, let me let me now introduce uh, tonight's speaker. Um, Francesco uh, Chiodelli is a professor of urban and legal geography at the University of Turin, and his research uh, is broadly concerned with institutions and the production of urban space. And he mainly works on housing informality in southern Europe and different forms of illegality. He's widely uh, published on this subject and co-edited in 2018 the book The Illicit and Illegal in Regional and Urban, Urban Governance and Development, Current Places. Is that the, is that the correct title? Yep. Yep, correct title. His work is also focused on the spatial dimension of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict a subject covered in his book, Shaping Jerusalem, also for Outledge in 2017. And I was looking through his back catalogue yesterday, and I, and I can see various uh, books that you need to have translated into English uh, to make them a bit more accessible to us. Anyway, this evening, Franklin will speak on the subject of informal production of space and focus on his work on illegal and informal housing practices in Italy. There will, of course, be an opportunity for us to ask lots of questions, and we're quite a... I think we're quite an intimate group this evening, uh, so hopefully there will be lots of questions. Um, but without further ado, Francesco. Okay. So thank you very much, Nick, for your invitation and for your kind introduction. Uh, so uh, let's start in this way, if it works. A few days ago, after the heavy rain, a part of the hillside in Ischia collapsed. And this is the, one of the results. Ischia is it's a wonderful island, uh, very close to, to Naples, but it's also one of the many places in Italy where informal and illegal housing is most widespread. We are speaking about thousands of housing units, and actually, Ischia is 
is at the crossroad of the two main geographies of illegal housing in Italy, namely southern Italy and coastal areas. What happened in this case is that the mudslide swept away some illegal housing units. 12 people died, including three children. This falling down house becomes soon the, the symbol of this tragedy. Actually, in Ischia, many housing units have been built illegally on hydrogeological risk area. And this kind of housing units, they always devastate the wonderful landscape and environment of the island and many places of Italy, and sometimes they also kill, as in case of Ischia. But the case of Ischia is not a unique case from this viewpoint. Such senseless tragedies are rather common in Italy. And the question is, how it is possible? Come on, how it is possible that at least the most blatant form of illegal or informal housing can be prevented or removed? This is one of the questions I will try to answer tonight, not, maybe not the, the main one. And I will refer to Italy, but uh, my talk is not about Italy, don't worry. I mean, there is no reason for being interested in Italy per se. My point is that I think that the analysis of informal housing in Italy can have, an, let's say, an epistemological value, a relevant epistemological value for the study of urban informality behind Italy. And my thesis is that by studying Italy, we can recognize quite clearly a politics of the public production of informal space, which take place in Italy as well, and this is my point, in many other countries around the world. Before moving to, to, the, to the analysis of, of this point, let me use a second to clarify a terminological question. I, I'm much aware of the debate around the terms, this very much sophisticated debate around the terms illegality, informality, irregularity, uh, illicit stuff. Uh, but for the sake of simplicity tonight, I will use informality and, and illegality as synonyms. So, but before analyzing the production of informal space, I might I must do a short overview of the phenomenon because I, I assume that you are not very much familiar with informal housing in Italy. Informality of the built environment in Italy is a multifaceted and complex phenomenon. The legal construction of entire buildings uh, is just a portion. There are at least two other relevant forms which must be mentioned. The first one is the legal occupation of existing buildings, so squatting. And the second and the third form is precarious settlement built by, by marginalized groups, in particular Roma people and migrants. And my point is that in order to recognize this politics of the production of informal space, what you have to do is to have a sort of holistic and comprehensive view of all these kinds of informality, which on the contrary is quite unusual. People working on illegal housing usually do not talk with people working on squatting. People working on squatting do not consider research on Roma camps and, and migrant settlements. My point is that this is, this is a pity, because in so doing, we, we lose the opportunity to understand in a comprehensive way the trajectories which are very clear of this politics of informal housing. So let's start first with a very short and descriptive overview of housing informality in Italy. Uh, let's start with the construction of illegal building. In Italy, this is so widespread phenomenon that we have also our vernacular term for, for it is abusivismo. And abusivismo is a massive, a really a huge phenomenon. Just to provide you with that sensation, a sensation of the magnitude, consider that in 2017, 17,000 unauthorized buildings have been built, accounting for 16% of the number, of the total number of new buildings. And 2017 was not an exception was very much in line with the previous decades. Consider that since the Second World War, between 15 to 20 percent of the total housing stock in Italy have been built illegally. And illegally means violating planning and building rules, but not property rights. Okay, so planning and building rules, such as building a house on a, on a agricultural land or building a house in a green area on the uh, hillside. We are speaking about millions of housing units which have been built partially or totally illegally. Another example is, this is Rome. I guess you know Rome, you maybe appreciate Rome, but I think you don't know that around 37%, I repeat, 37% of the housing stock in Italy have been built illegally, has an illegal origin. 
all the colored areas are the neighborhood with an illegal origin, then they have been later legalized, but their origin is illegal. So against this backdrop, it's quite evident that abusivismo is a structural component of the Italian urban development since the Second World War. And as such, it characterizes all Italy. It's not just some parts of Italy, not just uh, the usual suspect, the South, the island, the entire Italy, even if it, uh, in an even way, but also the north of Italy is also central Italy. In central Italy, around 10% of the housing stock have been built illegally. But what are we speaking when we speak about illegal housing in Italy? We are not speaking about this. I don't know if you know this movie. This is a wonderful movie by Pier Paolo Pasolini, uh, Accattone. Accattone was shot in, in so-called Borgate Romane. They were neighborhood illegal neighborhood built in the 15 and the 60s to host migrants coming from the countryside to the capital city or from the south to, to, to central Italy. In this kind of abusivism was related to poverty. But abusivism of the poor, which characterized the 15 and the 60s, then weakened and almost disappeared since the 80s. So today, when we speak about illegal housing, we refer to this kind of stuff. So we refer, and this is a quite well-known villaggio coppola close to Naples. So we speak about something done by the middle class that builds illegally different stuff that always, uh, often, sorry, uh, second homes in tourist area by the sea or on the mountains. So this is informal housing, illegal construction or housing in Italy, which is the, the let's say, Abuzviz is the main actor of housing informality uh, in my country. But at the same time, we don't have to forget that there is also another pillar. There is an, also another important variety of a housing informality, which is represented by the illegal occupation of existing buildings, squatting. And squatting is quite popular, so I guess you all know what squatting means, but when I, I refer to squatting, I'm not referring to this stuff. I'm not referring to political squatting. So I'm not referring to a housing occupation linked to the action of social movement for the right to the city or for the right to housing. Political squatting is politically relevant, is socially relevant, but at least in Italy, we must admit that from a quantitative viewpoint, it's very marginal. There are more books than actual cases of political squatting related to housing. The illegal occupation of housing units, contrary, is what I call an individualistic practice. It refers mainly to public housing units, while uh, political squatting never referred to public housing units. So it's completely independent from social movement. Just to, once again, to provide you with an idea of the magnitude of the phenomenon, we are speaking to data between 40 and 50,000 public flats illegally occupied in Italy. Around 5% of the entire public housing stock in Italy. And in some areas, for instance, in some uh, cities of the south, the, the percentage is around 10%. This is a picture of a neighborhood where I, I, I work about. And in this neighborhood, in Naples, 50% of the housing stock is illegally occupied. But what kind of occupation are we referring here? Here is the poor. So here is the action of poor people, mainly Italians, in a few cases, migrants, who squat public housing, mainly related to, to, to their economic condition. And how do they access these housing units? To the black market, okay? What, what they do is they pay, they buy illegally the housing, they buy, they buy illegally the housing unit from the previous owner. In some cases, there are also the action of organized crime uh, around this kind of occupation, but these cases where organized crime plays a relevant role are less numerous than one should would think. Currently, this practice of buying a public fund is simply a widespread social practice which is carried out individually to the market, even if the black market. So we have the first pillar, abusivismo. We have the second pillar, the legal occupation of public buildings, so individualistic squatting. And then we have also a third component of our picture. Our, the picture I'm providing to you is not complete, obviously, but I would say that it includes the main forms of informalizing in Italy, in particular if you consider also this third variation, which is represented by precarious settlements of marginalized groups, 
in particular uh, migrants, both regular and irregular, and Roma people. Again, just a few data. Uh, we're speaking around uh, 50,000 migrants living in these kind of precarious settlements and around 20,000 Roma people living in formal and informal uh, camps. So it's not a huge phenomenon, but let's say it's not irrelevant at the same time. And once again, this is an enduring phenomenon. This phenomenon has characterized Italy for decades, at least three and four decades. And if I had time, I would deal also with the specific geography of these precarious settlements, which is, uh, in many cases, in particular for migrants, related to seasonal workers working the agriculture in southern regions and building these kind of settlements. This kind of settlement has the shape of slums, of what the, we call slums, or rather, more precisely, of informal settlement in some African or uh, Asian countries. So this is just to provide a very quick, very superficial, but it's for a matter of time, overview of the different variation of informal housing. At this point, let me do a brief aside. Because <clears throat> my initial idea was to reach this point, maybe in a bit more sophisticated and detailed way, and then to devote myself to the discussion of some reduction in understand, reductionist understanding uh, which still characterize the academic debate on, on informality. I'm referring in particular to the rigid dualism between informality of need versus informality of desire. I refer to global south versus global north <laughs> dichotomy. But then I told myself, oh, come on, it's, it's, it's too banal. You are in a prestigious university with outstanding uh, scholars in, in the audience. This is something taken for granted. I mean, do you really think that there is anyone who believes that a simplistic geographical metaphor like global north and global south has any relevant heuristic analytical value? Or do you really believe and think that you need to explain that we require a much more sophisticated understanding from a geographical perspective of informality, recognizing, for instance, some fringe areas like the Mediterranean basin, some overlaps, some poles, some peripheries? Do you really believe that the rigid dichotomy, structural agency, uh, need, desire is adequate to explain a large part of the phenomenon of informality? Obviously, I told myself, no, this is too, too banal. So I decided to take another direction. And the direction is exactly the direction of explaining something which is maybe not more, much more sophisticated, but probably a bit less obvious. That is the production of informal space and its related politics. The point of departure for this discussion is this one. The variety of informality has a variety of causes, obviously. And these causes are not only multiple, but obviously they are also complex, intertwined. Yeah. <laughs> so they, I mean, they are rooted in different spheres, uh, and this is obvious economic, cultural, legal, institutional spheres. And this complex entanglement of causes has been well, very well described by this picture and, and these this scholar. So I take this for granted. So the point is not to question this entanglement, this complex entanglement, which is the only way to explain in accurate way housing informality in a way. However, I think that for analytical reasons, we can extract in a way and analyze it in a dedicated and direct way uh, the role of public institution and in particular the role of public spheres. So in so doing, I think we can identify a specific and intentional public production of informal space. And if we look in a diachronic and comprehensive way to this production, and to this production of all the different forms of informality I've mentioned, not in a sectoral way, but in a comprehensive way, we can recognize also a specific politics of this production. But to understand this public production, we have to keep in mind that it arises in the framework of a structural ambivalence between repression and accommodation. Repression is never unique. It's never the main approach to the informal space. I'm referring to Italy precisely, but I'm quite convinced that these are also applies to other countries, to many other countries. Repression maybe is the main rhetorics in some period. Repression can be the main practice for some varieties of informality in some periods. It's obviously dominant on law and books, but overall is only one small piece of the public approach, which on the contrary is based on accommodation. 
and accommodation on purpose just composed by formalization. So by laws which regularize informal housing units. However, the reality is much more nuanced, multifaceted. And accommodation is composed by different forms. For analytical reason, I recognize six, six main forms. And each of these forms is related to and generate also different legal statuses of informality, but I will not focus on this, just simply to show to you also the internal variety from a legal perspective of informality, just to create a much more complex picture, but I will focus only on the forms of public accommodation. And obviously, there is some a kind of deliberate neglect in many cases, like in the case of Ischia. So you know perfectly that there is a certain informal practice, but you deliberately avoid to place within the view of institutions. And if this is not possible, if you cannot avoid for many reasons the identification of this practice, what you do after reporting, you don't do anything. For year, for decade, so inaction comes into, into the game. And for if for any reason you have to start the process for the sanctioning of this informal practice, the tactics for accommodation is administrative delay and intricacy. You make the process extremely complex and therefore extremely uh, slow. Yesterday I was reading a wonderful article on an Italian newspaper about the case of Ischia, and the, this article was telling the story of a house, illegal housing unit in Ischia, which was reported, so identified in 1990. It was demolished in 2021. 31 years later, and the problem is not these 31 years. It's, the problem is that this is not the worst case. This case is a case of administrative success initially, because in many other cases, they simply they don't get at the end of the process for decades. Okay, so regression, inaction, administrative delay. Then we have recognition, which is much more well known. It's, it's, one known practice also promoted by many international organizations in the global south, which is based mainly on providing public support in the form of public services and infrastructure. In Italy, it's not that much. It's not much providing uh, public services and infrastructure, but it's much more composed by this kind of neglection, inaction, and administrative delay. Then we can come to formalization. So the only legal pillar, the only formal pillar of this public form of accommodation, which is quite Simply, and then I will specify, it implies a change in the legal status of the object to a specific law. However, this is not the end of the story. We have a fourth step, which is legitimation, legitimization. Uh, it's something more than recognition and formalization. It can be based, and usually it's based on both recognition and formalization, but uh, legitimization implies that informal practice is justified. Is publicly justified and is, it is included in the sphere of ordinary and expected social practices. So it's not just a question of legalization, it's not just a normative matter, it's an ethical matter. It's a question of social acceptance, it's, it's a matter of public ethics. So if these are the, let's say, the six main channels, the six main forms of public accommodation, each type of informality which I've mentioned before is characterized by a distinct assemblage of these different forms of public accommodation plus a certain amount of repression. And it is exactly this assemblage which favors the production and ensures the survival and reproduction of informality. We can see what this means in practice if we go back to Ischia. So we are back to Ischia to our falling down building. This building, as every legal building on the island and every legal building in Italy, is situated at the crossroad of two spheres, ordinary measure and exceptional measure, where ordinary measure are usually repressive measure, and consider that in Italy, repressive measure against the housing legality are extremely tough, are extremely harsh. Illegal building is a criminal offense, but not only Every legal building must be demolished by the owner in 30 days after receiving the demolition order. So you have only 30 days in order to demolish your house. If you don't do this, the building and the land is transferred to the municipality without any compensation, so it's expropriated. So a very tough law, 
against illegal housing, but what happens, it happens then at this point, accommodation come into the game. In particular, in the form of neglection, inaction, and administrative de delay and intricacy. Consider, again, the case of Ischia. In Ischia, we have thousands of illegal buildings that are formally unknown to public institutions, even if we, we are on an island, on a small island where everybody knows everything, literally, literally everything, but public institutions don't know. And if they know, as in the case of 600, 600 procedures against housing illegality, these procedures have been ongoing for several years. And this is not an exception. If you look at data, it's about the demolition orders at the national level, you can understand what inaction, delay, and uh, means. Between 2004 and 2017, only 20% 20 of demolition order were implemented. And keep in mind that by law, every demolition order must be implemented in 30 days. And if not, the land and the house is expropriated, but only 3% of undemolished buildings were expropriated. And if you go to Campania region, the region where Naples and Ischia are located, you see that only 3% of demolition order, 500 orders, over 17,000 orders have been implemented, and only 2% were expropriated. So against this backdrop, it's clear that such enduring and widespread situation becomes a form of recognition of illegal housing. So there is an explicit recognition of informal housing. But if it is not enough, we have also to consider that there is this fear of exceptional measures which impinges on, on this falling down housing unit. And the, in order to understand the sphere of regularization, we have to consider that in 1985, a national amnesty law for illegal building, this so called the Kundoni Delizio, was approved by the national government. 11 million requests were submitted for this national law. And this national law was very much criticized at that time. But let's say that, from my viewpoint, it was not so insane, it was not so, so bizarre. The idea was to come to terms with the past. At that time, the, the state was ready to recognize that for two decades, since the aftermath of the Second World War in the 80s, the state was not able to manage urban development and to, to satisfy the housing needs of a part of the Italian population. So the state said, OK, we recognize our, this, our failure. We regularize it, but then no more housing legality, just repression. So the, the amnesty law was at that time presented as an exceptional me measure, which would never be repeated. So something very much unique as ex and exceptional in the administrative arena. But what happened at nine years later, a second amnesty law was approved, 2.6 uh, uh, million application. Nine years later again, 2003, a third national law. Uh, amnesty law was approved, 1.7 million application. Then also in 20, remember well, 2014, there was another attempt, a failed attempt at the national law. But in 2018, uh, the county government approved another amnesty law, which was partial, only from some area, for some areas, including the island of Ischia. So you can see that the repetition of amnesty law Turned, turned into a clear message. The state legitimizes this practice. You can build illegally because sooner or later there will be, you will be able to regularize your business. So there is a social acceptance and the public acceptance that this is something ordinary, which should be expected by public authority. If this picture is not enough to, to justify the, the, the falling down uh, building, you have also to consider that with reference to regularization me and measure, there, all, there is also into the game this, once again, administrative delay and intricacy. What do I mean? During the three, for, for the three amnesty laws, 50 million applications were submitted in total, okay? This is a huge number, and you, you can be shocked, but you should be shocked by this number. One third of these applications for regularization are yet to be processed. And 3.5 million of these applications refer to 1985 amnesty law. So there are people in Italy, and not just a few people. We are speaking about millions of households 
who have been waiting for 37 years the reply to their submission. How is this possible? The answer to this question is complex, but one major part of the answer can be found in the fact that while waiting for the answer to your request for regularization, any action against the legal building is frozen. Okay? So if the action is frozen, if you don't receive a, a, any reply to your application, this is a kind of informal regularization, quite obviously. And if you would be able to, to, to investigate these five million applications, we definitely would discover that a large part of this application refers to building which cannot be regularized. Why? Because if you reject an application, then you have to start the uh, demolition process, the expropriation process, and, and so on, and, and so forth. So instead of rejecting, you prefer to close the, the process. So the administrative delay is very, a very clear tactic to provide a very clear recognition, if not legitimation, legitimization of this kind of, of building. So overall, you can see that now you, you, you can understand the existence and persistence of this object, which lies at the, at the intersection of tactics and practice of accommodation, which are promoted by many political actors at both national and local level, plus some bureaucratic actors and at the local level. And if you do this exercise, this analytical exercise, for all the cases of different varieties of informality which I've mentioned, so illegal occupation of public housing buildings, precarious settlements by migrants, uh, illegal uh, informal Roma camp, you would discover that a specific public production of informal housing in place and this production is messy. It's definitely messy because there are contingent fluctuations in space and time of this production, and it's definitely uncoordinated. So measures for abusivism are not directly related with policies for Roma camps, and policies for Roma camps are not related to practice uh, uh, for the regularization of uh, illegal uh, occupation of, of public housing. But however, all these different forms of public production in formal housing are convergent and they converge to an enduring politics of informality, which becomes clear only if you have this diachronic understanding and comprehensive understanding of informality. And you can perceive that this enduring politics of informality is composed by four interlinked movements. The, four, the first movement, movement is the selective legitimization of specific social groups. The two guys are uh, Silvio Berlusconi and Bettino Craxi, the fathers of the three amnesty uh, laws. Why the selective legitimization of social group? Because the right practices and aspiration of some central social groups are legitimized through these policies. And I'm referring in particular to the middle class and to home owners. I mean, uh, our Sandy scholars have explained to us that home ownership is at the center of the Italian housing system. So home owners are one of the pillars of uh, our country, my country, sorry. And <laughs> the political system is centered on the middle class. What happened in this enduring politics of informality is that these two pillars are kept together and at the same time, these politics also benefit and distribute benefits across some other central actors, in particular to the building sector which is, once again, at the center of the Italian political economy. The building sector means small construction farms on developers, low-wage work, and so on and so forth. And this enduring selective legitimization of the middle class, homeowners, and the building sector wasn't going for several decades, let's say at least four decades, as a unique movement, but at a certain point of Italian history, was coupled with a parallel movement. This parallel movement was and yet in base of stigmatization and uh, marginalization. At the end of the, uh, of the 90s, we entered into the period of a new right-wing uh, emergence of parties in Italy, as well as your country, whatever your country is. So in many countries in Europe, all around the, the Western world. And this guy is one of the, let's say, the, is the leader of one of these new right-wing populist movement he is Matteo Salvini, currently Minister for Infrastructure, before he was the Minister of the Interior, but he's the leader of the right-wing party, the Lega. 
uh, overall, this in particular Liga Nord, Liga for Salvini, whatever you want to, to call it, uh, this kind of part is promoted many policies, racist policies, policies against ethnic groups, which were not related to informal housing per se, but at a certain point, these policies grafted themselves, entered into the politics of informality, and entered because the removal of illegal housing, of housing illegality, became the object and is still the object of local and national political campaign which target exclusively marginal and ethnic groups, Roma camps, migrant settlements, squatting. We have to admit that these repressive politics are not very effective in removing the problem. So they didn't remove the problem, but they were very powerful in reshaping the political and the public discourse. Just let me provide you with an example. You might know that now we have one of the most far-right government in Europe, uh, the government led by Fratelli d'Italia, uh, let's say to oversimplify, sorry, it's post-fascist post, uh, party. Uh, obviously, Libanon has a central role in, in, this, uh, in this government. Uh, do you know what, what was the first uh, measure of this new government a few months ago? Do you think it was against the housing crisis, the economic crisis, uh, the question of energy base? No, it was a measure against the legal occupation of land and buildings for rape parties. And we discussed, we discussed for weeks this kind of, 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 of decree. So it, it seems to be a joke, but this is a powerful reshaping of the political debate in Italy. So we don't discuss about the housing crisis, we discuss about the rape parties and the legal occupation of uh, land and, and buildings. So these two streams, so the selective legitimization and the ethnic marginalization were parallel and were effectively traveled by a vector, which was very powerful and is the vector of the governmentalization and bureaucratization of, of social issues. What's the point here? That major social problems, poverty, housing deprivation, migrants, uh, uh, exploitation, are transformed and were transformed into administrative and police question. So in a way, they are removed from both the public discourse and the arena of policies. And not only they were replaced by security charming and revanchist discourses, but they have also been replaced by administrative and judicial procedures. So we don't have policies for the housing crisis or for migrants' exploitation. We have only administrative and judicial procedures against the occupation of public housing, the violation of, uh, of, of property rights. So the solution to this problems is delegated to the administrative, the police, and the judicial body. So in other words, there is a kind of judicial dislocation of the response to, to social problems. And what is interesting is that in Italy, we know that this dislocation can provide an answer to this question. I mean, the judicial body, the administrative body, is not able to deal in an effective way with illegal housing. The phenomenon is too big for them, okay? But this is not a problem. This is an opportunity. This is intentional because in this way, informality can survive a spread. And why is this an opportunity? Because this is an opportunity to preserve gray areas. I'm referring here precisely to gray areas of discretion and power for political and bureaucratic actors. Actually, housing informality is the realm of opaque, informal transaction, negotiation, agreement, and is exactly through this opaque arrangement that some institutional actor can exercise their power without any constraints. They can shape clientelism. Informality is a gold mine for them. And this is a, the, the tough reality, because they can exchange accommodation, which, as I stressed before, is nearly composed by discretional measure, so they exchange accommodation for political consensus and the inhabitants of informal housing can be and are the main constituency for several local and regional politicians, but also for some political parties, in particular in South and Italy. So thanks to these great spaces of discretionality, you can exchange accommodation for political consensus. At the same time, in many cases, you can also exchange accommodation for illegal economic gains. Here I should open the chapter of corruption, which is enormous, which is extremely interesting in Italy, but I don't have time. But keep in mind that electoral consensus is not the only stake for these gray areas, but also 
illicit economic gains are on, on the table. So just to provide you with a short summary of this reasoning, my point is that the main ingredients of this part of production of informal space are some flavors, let's say several flavors are of accommodation. Some of them are opaque, informal, gray, and just some of, of them are formal or legal, plus a pinch of repression. And the result of this receipt is an enduring politics of informality, which in a simultaneous way provide a selective legitimization of specific social groups, the middle class, the homeowners, and the building sector, at the same time promote a native basis stigmatization of and marginalization of ethnic groups and marginal groups. And this is achieved through this governmentalization and bureaucratization of social issues. So the transformation of social problems into question of administration, management, and judicial uh, procedures. And all of these allow the preservation of gray areas because these gray areas are really gold mine for many political and bureaucratic actors in Italy. So since it's almost dinner time, I, I, I think I will continue with this gastronomic metaphor. I mean, obviously, this politics of public production of informal space is a typical Italian dish, okay? It's like, like pizza. Uh, uh, and it's the byproduct of specific cultural, social, economic, historical, institutional conditions. So the point is not to, uh, let's say, neglect the specificity of the context of, of Italy. However, like for pizza, we must admit that ingredients for pizza are not so uncommon. So the weaknesses of formal economy, the shortcoming of public action, the importance of gray arrangement in everyday life are not a typical Italian question. For instance, they are widespread in several South European countries. I mean, these countries are like a great family from this point of view. I've been working for more than 10 years on Israel and Palestine. The same case for Israel and Palestine, for Eastern Europe as well, for many countries of the so-called global south. So what's the point? The point is that I have the impression that Italy is not an exception, rather is an hyper example. An hyper example means that the feature of this phenomenon, the production of informal space, are exacerbated, are more blatant, more crystal clear in, in Italy than in square. But like for pizza, you can have also pizza outside Italy. Uh, maybe the, the taste is different. Maybe there are variations in the ingredients, like the barbaric variation of pineapples. <laughs> but we can agree that this is still pizza. And we can agree that this is still the production, the politics of the production of informal space. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Francesco. Um, we have the uh, opportunity for questions. I shall be the ro roaming microphone for this evening, because if we have a microphone, then we're videoing this, so uh, we'll pick up your questions. So, um, I mean, Italy is somewhere where I often spend a, a lot of time, uh, luckily, I'm very lucky in that respect. And I've always uh, wondered about the toughness of the laws and the precision of many laws as well, but obviously the lack of enforcement of those tough and very precise laws. So you, you've sort of opened up an answer today, um, but but why why is it that uh, a pizza is a pizza in Italy? Why is it that uh, that things are so extreme? I mean, culturally, because I've always thought there must be a cultural answer. I mean, you've obviously um, explained in uh, very precise terms about this phenomenon, but but why is it that, that there is so little uh, enforcement in reality? Like we collect questions and rebuttal? Yeah, yeah, no, no, we, that, that could be the first question, but okay. is there anybody else who would like to uh, start us off? Big Bob, great. Thanks very much, uh, Francesco, I really enjoyed that. Um, I, uh, well, I think it's fair to say that we have, we certainly have some pizza here uh, in the UK. Um, slightly different uh, manifestation, but it's certainly here. Um, I, um, I was sort of struck by this sort of very grey nature that you characterise the accommodation of informality in, in Italy. Um, and I wondered, but I wondered if um, there had been sort of informality created by deregulation. So, you know, actually stripping away certain regulations in the way that we've done here in the UK with, um, for example, through 
relaxation of planning laws um, and uh, you know, uh, really sort of topical cases, uh, the conversion uh, of um, office spaces to, to residential, um, that's now uh, allowed to happen without, you know, without going through planning. I wondered if there were similar sort of activities in, in Italy. Okay, should we take a third question and then... Thank you. Um, thanks a lot for your presentation. Uh, I, you were talking about informality uh, that is linked to uh, property rights and uh, uh, planning law, etc. And, and very interesting the process of uh, uh, legitimization, accommodation that are built within the systems as well uh, to enable uh, these people living in these informal conditions to go on with their lives. And I was wondering in, in, whether there are other systems uh, uh, of uh, uh, laws or, or uh, rules, like I'm thinking of uh, insurance, for instance, whether that is uh, also complicit in this process of accommodation. Uh, I'm thinking, for instance, in, in Spain, if, if you build illegally, then how, I mean, uh, the practice happens a lot, but did you, then you would get a lot of, into a lot of trouble in order to get a mortgage approved with a bank. So in that sense, that system, which is not part of property rights, is not part of a planning law, but is acting as a form of a enforcement that is not, <laughs> is not part of the, of the planning system or the property rights. So I was wondering whether you've considered these other dimensions, these other systems outside the, the planning laws and the, and the property rights and how the, those might be affecting the informal Okay, great. So, uh, three questions. Hopefully, um, you remember all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, <laughs> thank you for the questions. They are straight on some, some, some central points. Uh, let, let's start by the second one. Uh, if this kind of gray situation has been created by due regulation, so for instance, the relaxation of, of planning laws, I, I would say, uh, I mean, no, okay? I mean, the, the, a more mustard answer would be better, but I have, if I had to choose between yes and no, I would say no. And this is quite clear if you look also at the historical trajectory of, uh, for instance, illegal being or visibismo, was not very much related to changes in, in the planning law. Maybe it is related to other kind of, of institutional changes, but definitely not related to planning law. Also because in Italy, still today, I mean, this is a discussed topic, uh, I don't see any kind of very tough relaxation of planning laws. It's still very, I mean, very old style, very comprehensive uh, system. Even if you have, can have some negotiation, the system, the planning system is still quite, let's say, traditionally based on zoning, on, uh, very precise uh, rules. So I think it, this is not the central point. Maybe the point is that, uh, Nick, you said why things are so different. <laughs> Good question. Uh, obviously, that there should, can be also a, let's say, a cultural uh, why. I mean, as you might know, in Italy, there are, there are also the, this debate about a specific culture, I mean, the debate uh, about family, so specific culture, which is related to the backward character of some parts of Italy. This is a part of the explanation. I'm not very much uh, into that side of the explanation. My point is that uh, this is related, for instance, I mean, I try to provide a partial other here. This is related to the very strong political incentives, the, 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 the composition, of, but also the orientation of, of the political system, which is uh, very able to extract uh, some benefits from this system, and this has been ongoing for for, for decades. I mean, a large part of, of the Italian history has been characterized by, I mean, democratic, democracy Christian and Forza Italia at the center of the political arena, and they have their constituency in the middle class, in some parts of the south, in particular for the democracy Christiana. And I, I think that this specific political history of Italy is part of this explanation, together with the. Culture together also with some internal problems of the bureaucratic staff. Uh, 
uh, I mean, for instance, Italy is, is historically characterized by this deep weakness of the administrative body. So also some I mean, constraints related to human resources to deal with the, these issues are, are relevant. For instance, I tell this story. I've been working for seven years in L'Aquila. L'Aquila is the capital town of Abruzzo region in central Italy. And I decided to, to do a bit of research on uh, uh, amnesty, uh, so the request for amnesty laws uh, uh, which were not yet processed. So I went to the, uh, the, the, the planning office and I said, uh, can, can I add, because it's a public document, can I add uh, the, the PDF file or the Excel file with all the requests? And they said, okay, come, come with me. They bring me into the office, they open a, a, a book where you, they have three colored pen, red for uh, processed, uh, yellow for not yet processed, uh, green for other problems. So they are still hand written on, on a book, all these, these requests. So this is also a problem. So they don't even have an Excel file of all the requests. And we are in the capital city of Abruzzo, which is not the most developed region in Italy, but it's not, I mean, it's not Enna Core or other parts much more depressed than Italy. So I think that the convergence of different streams of progress are the, the answer to your, to your question about the harsh situation of Italy. And maybe there can be also other other processes in place, which, however, are not very, very effective. I mean, in Italy as well, you cannot ask for a mortgage if you build an illegal house. But for instance, not always you build a completely legal house. In some cases, you simply build one floor which is authorized, and then you build two more floors. So there are several tricks in order to avoid this problem. For instance, consider that in Italy, for speaking, since 2014, if you live in a uh, illegal housing, uh, in, in, illegally occupied housing unit, you cannot have the connection with water, electricity, and this other part of the set, which is, I mean, an extremely repressive uh, revanchist uh, law, but we have this law, but it doesn't work. I mean, in just a few cases, because there are many other uh, street level bureaucratic practices, which are practices of accommodation. If you study this practice, you see that there is a big gap between loan books and loan practices. So bureaucrats are playing also this accommodation role, for instance, not to cut electricity to many, uh, to many families, uh, to many households, so on and so forth. So uh, I mean, obviously it was a brief and uh, oversimplified answer, but uh, I hope they satisfied a bit your I'm not, not sure if it was uh, oversimplified. It's a very comprehensive. Thank you. Do we have any more um, more questions? Okay, great. I'll I'll take three. I've got three. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the uh, powerful insights from the presentation. Thank you very much. I just want to ask a bit more about uh, corruption. The interests me, uh, and also that here in London there are lots of debates going on about the way in which the planning system formally creates informality, in other spaces of informality, in order to facilitate investment. So from Russian oligarchs, from criminal gangs, whoever it might be. Uh, yet it's formal. And so somebody giving a presentation about London, like me, I, I hardly ever mention that, even though it's fundamental, yet it's not really mentioned because in Britain it's a very open, fair system, of course, and we can look at things. So there's a little bit of, of a cultural issue about that, but I just wonder in the Italian context, how do you research corruption? I mean, some of the things you've got here as well, about even on informality and illegality, how do you get the evidence to show this in methodological terms without risking your life? <laughs> you know, we had that problem in London in that we had a project that was as part of the project to look at the dark side of planning, but how do I send a researcher into the field to go and look at those things? It's a difficult, it's not my problem, it's the researcher's problem, but I, I don't like to do it. Um, but seriously, how do, you, how do you do that? And what is the scale of it? I mean, you put Craxi and uh, Berlusconi up there from Milan back in the 80s and, and the, the clean hands and all that corruption scandal. Which, it seems to me to be absolutely fundamental to the construction of all of the business areas in the centre of Milan, uh, a lot of the big projects that have gone on in commercial as well as residential. And it's hardly mentioned. It's hardly mentioned by people, it seems to me. Yeah, it's absolutely fundamental. So how do you research it? How do you, do you get evidence that you can show the dark side? 
Okay, we'll take two more, then uh, go to answers. Um, yeah, really interesting presentation. Um, I was struck by, I think, what you described as the selective legitimization. And I was just wondering whether there wasn't, maybe there is a sort of grassroots resistance that is sort of rising up against the selective aspect of legitimization. And I'm just aware of, you know, I mean, Italy has a strong history and culture of co-ops and some quite radical, as I understand it, housing approaches to local house. I just wondered whether that played a role in some of what you were describing. Thanks a lot for your great talk. Uh, this is a question for the benefit of many of the students who are here who are probably going to have to write comparative essays in the coming two weeks <laughs> and hear about this more. I was really interested by your typology of the six forms of accommodation. And as you said, they came from your Italian fieldwork, but they sound pretty universal. So I was wondering whether you had tried to apply them for comparative work with colleagues that have tested these six concepts across Europe or the global south, and whether they seem to hold well to make sense of Delhi, Sao Paulo, as well as um, the cities you've been looking at. And if so, that's an idea for the students who have to write comparative essays. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Oh, OK. Uh, hi. Uh, well, Nick and Martin, uh, I gave two options for my lecture. The first one was this one. The second one was about corruption, <laughs> because this is my second topic of research. So I'm very happy to, 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 ask, to reply to your question. Uh, because I, I work very much on corruption, but also on the role of organized crime, market type organized crime in urban planning. Uh, so let's say that methodologically speaking is kind of difficult. I found a gold mine in judicial report. I mean, if you can access little judicial reports, it means you can access thousands of pages of not only of, of analysis, but or where cappings. I don't know how it works here. But it's, I mean, we, you can do proper research, I mean, in depth, let's say, not infographic, but in depth research on this question only if you have access to judicial report and all the material. So uh, also interviews with, uh, for the acquisition, everything. If this is the case, you can, you can do. I tried also to do research in, let's say, more direct way. For instance, I triangulated this judicial report with interviews, and you can do, obviously, on on the side of the, I mean, the, the municipal staff. I wasn't able, and I, I was afraid also to go and be interviewed to these guys, so I, I skipped this side. Uh, for instance, I did a, a research in, in Naples, in Ponticelli, uh, in a neighborhood which is occupied by, by people, and it was 10 years ago occupied also thanks to the, the, the Camorra clan. So, uh, in that case, uh, I was able to, to go into because I had a colleague from that area. Otherwise, it also speaks the language. I wasn't able to un understand the language of people living in the neighborhood because we are talking about the lowest ladder of the scale. They, they only speak Napolitan. So, I mean, this is, this is very hard triangulation, but for me, for my point of view, you can only start when you have judicial report. Otherwise, you have to stay on the surface, and I think you don't advance so much the, uh, I mean, the, the reflection. Uh, selective uh, legitimization and any kind of resistance, if I well understood your question, I would say that, yes, there is a resistance. So there, is, there are also several social movements about this, but the social movements are in favor of this selective legitimization. In Italy, it arises a political issues when you start the demolition, not when you legitimize. When you, for instance, when you approve this law, uh, sorry, the, the, the last amnesty law for Ischia, and was very much under the spotlight because, I mean, they did an amnesty law for Ischia, and then in Ischia happened what, 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 what happened, okay? And everybody, and nobody said anything, okay? Really, nobody. There is a, I mean, a temporary scandal, but the only social movement is in favor, and we, I mean, in Italy we have the so-called Comitati di Abusivi, so uh, local grassroots movements of illegal uh, housing in, in Abitan. We put a lot of pressure, and always the narrative is that we are the poor, 
We are people in need. So we built legally because we don't have any other option. In some cases, maybe it is, but my point is that today we have is some cases of informality of the poor, this is the informality of the migrants. Because if you want to build your house, self building the house, you need to own the land, you need also to have the resources to build the structure, which has no chance. Okay, they are regular housing units in many cases, so they cost less than informal will, but they cost. So my point is that these rhetorics of need, which is also very much embedded into the political system, many cases of the attempt to regularize these army as a units are also related to this narrative. This is just a matter of poor poverty. I think this is only the way to justify what they, they can say, that they do this because they extract a lot of benefit at the political level from, from this thing. Claire, the answer is very easy to your question. No, I never tested. I, I never did this kind of inductive research. For the moment, I mean, I, I'm still stuck on, on the situation of Italy because, uh, I mean, what is surprising is that there's not so much research on this. I mean, we have a giant problem of housing informality, of corruption, organized crime, but from the point of view of geography, of crime, there's almost no research. So this could be the further step. Uh, so I, I think that it, this, is a, this is a good direction because the idea is that not to, to, to talk just about Italy, but to talk of Italy in order to talk about the general problems. So that was the, that's the idea of this lecture. I don't know if I was affected. Not that. This was okay, we, we have uh, a little bit more time. I mean, uh, I'm a bit worried that somebody will steal our catering outside, so uh, I quite fancy a glass of wine. But any more, any more questions? Hi, thanks so much for the talk. Just a quick question. Um, are there sites allocated for Roma people through the planning system? Um, that's the case in the UK, and I was wondering if there's element of formality to that. Yeah, the situation is extremely complex. I'm not an expert on the question of Roma camps. In Italy, we have two kinds of Roma camps. We have legal Roma camps, and then we have informal Roma camps. But the, the boundary between the two are not so clear. In many cases, there are processes in which informal Roma camps are evicted, I mean, are formally evicted, but people keep living there, so they are just coming into informal cases in which informal Roma camps are legitimized in some way or recognized. So the situation, the, the answer is yes, we have formal Roma camps, but formality is, uh, let's say, just a label for different objects, also with a different legal, legal statuses. But I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on the specific question of Roma camps, I'm concerned. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Francesco. Uh, I mean, should you wish to transport your research to the UK, uh, we, can, we can act like your Neapolitan friend and introduce you to, well, the London situation. But actually, I'm more interested in some rural places, you know, out into the countryside. So I'd love you to, you know, take up the mantle there and uh, do some investigations in the future. So it's, a, it's an open invitation. But thank you very much for a fascinating talk tonight. You've, you've answered many of the questions that I had uh, about Italy and about these tough laws that are never enforced. Although uh, I'm going to probably quiz you a little bit more uh, as the night goes on. So there, is, there will be an opportunity outside to uh, ask uh, Francesco any more questions that you have. Or, uh, so hopefully there will still be some wine uh, remaining. So I think the last thing to do is to say grazie mille, uh, Francesca, and um, uh, the usual way.